Great. So welcome, everyone. This is Emily Clark at Quasi. I am the training coordinator. And this is the second talk in the Quasi virtual workshop on data-driven hydrology education. The workshop was organized by Venkatesh Marwad at Purdue University and Ben Ruddle at Arizona State University. Um, and today we're going to be hearing from Stephen Margolis. Um, at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, he's going to present a couple of e-textbook and modular watershed models for hydrology education. Just a little background in case you missed the talk last week. The virtual workshop on data-driven hydrology education, um, the objective is to present recent and ongoing developments in the area of data and modeling-driven active learning tools or techniques in hydrology classrooms. So the target audience um, is basically hydrology instructors who are interested in adding active learning tools that exploit both computational and public domain data sets into their teaching. Um, so the virtual workshop consists of three once a week lectures, so last week, this week, and then next week. Um, and each talk in the virtual workshop focuses on demonstrating existing tools or systems that use observed data and computational tools for teaching hydrology. So welcome to the talk this afternoon. The virtual workshop also culminates in a virtual poster session. Um, so the idea behind the poster session is that if you have a poster um, or if you have a, a tool for teaching hydrology you'd like to share, you can create a poster and then discuss it virtually in a virtual breakout room. So if you're interested in presenting a poster in the virtual poster session, please send your submissions to this comm manager at quasi.org email address that you see on your screen by the end of the day today. Submissions are due. Um, and you can find more information at www.quasi.org slash virtual dash workshop dash on data-driven hydrology education. That URL is right on the screen as well. And then one other announcement before we get started. Um, we do have an upcoming hands-on training workshop in October, the role of runoff and erosion on soil carbon stocks from soilscapes to landscapes. That workshop is sponsored by Purdue University, the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and Quasi, um, and it's led up by Thanos Papanikolaou at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, it takes place on October 20th and 21st at Purdue University, and registration is currently open until September 27th. So there are a limited number of student travel grants available to graduate students and postdocs to attend the workshop. So if that's something that you may be interested in, feel free to contact me directly. Um, so with that, I'm going to send it over to Dr. Margolis. Um, professor Steve Margolis has been a professor at UCLA in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering since 2002. His research interests lie in the general areas of terrestrial hydrology, meteorology, cold land processes, remote sensing, and data assimilation. And his teaching interests lie in the broad area of hydrologic science and earth system science. Um, so Dr. Margolis, um, you can take it away whenever you're ready. Great. Uh, thank you, Emily, and uh, to Venkatesh for the invite to share some of our recent work. So as the title suggests, I'm going to uh, spend today talking about a project we've been working on for the last handful of years um, that has both a textbook component and a hands-on modeling component. And I'll mention it later, but just 
to be clear here, this is all open access materials. It's something that I hope after seeing today, if you haven't already checked it out, you, you give it a look. And we're happy to um, kind of help people not only have access to it, but um, help it evolve going forward. So just a little bit of the history and background on this. Uh, I teach an introduction to hydrology course at UCLA. It's nominally a junior level course uh, with a lot of seniors as well. And I've been teaching it here since 2003. And the focus of the course is on physically based process level understanding of hydrology. So uh, just to put it in context, it's a little more on the kind of engineering science or uh, hydrologic science end of the spectrum more so than engineering hydrology per se. We have kind of follow-on courses that focus more on hydraulics and um, simpler rainfall runoff models. So what we've done is kind of in this broader hydrologic science context. In terms of the key goals, and this is really just more or less a statement of my teaching philosophy. This is what we've tried to integrate into the course and into this material. Uh, one, and this is, I think, maybe more challenging for those of us who teach in engineering departments, develop a, have students develop a very deep conceptual understanding of the processes we're talking about. So engineers you know, are tempted to jump to equations right, or, right away without necessarily getting this kind of conceptual level understanding. And so we try, as much as we focus on quantitative analysis to really have students gain this kind of bigger picture understanding. That said, we're engineers and scientists here, so we also want to have students develop quantitative understanding. Uh, another goal is we want students to become proficient in understanding the connectedness of hydrology. So one theme of this course and the material is Rather than just kind of having everything in silos in a disconnected way, we try to um, integrate things as much as possible to see hydrology and not only integrated picture kind of at the watershed scale, but up to the global scale. And then an uh, underlying theme that kind of connects most of this is understanding spatial and temporal variability. We, of course, want to incorporate hands-on learning modeling opportunities. And another thing we, we aim for is to have students become proficient in analyzing, plotting, and explaining data. And we try to do this kind of as a general service. So this, while the, the context we do this in is in hydrology, we hope to kind of use this as a gateway for students to become better at dealing with real data, understanding it, uh, gaining insight by analyzing it and plotting it. So of course, that's a long list with some challenges. And then I'll talk today about some of our proposed solutions. Uh, one challenge is a need for a textbook that actively enhances the learning by students. Um, I'll fully admit there's no such thing as a perfect textbook. We've probably all struggled with that. And in some cases, in the worst cases, of course, that you can be fighting the textbook. And that might be due to notational differences or the way the textbook is constructed relative to the class. And so part of what we're going to do is develop a textbook that is flexible and enhances the learning um, in the classroom and out. So our proposed solution for this is an uh, electronic open access textbook. Uh, one of the things we try to highlight in the textbook is multimedia content. And for a few reasons, one is that tends to be a good way to really cement conceptual learning. It's also an easy way to connect to the classroom. So much of the multimedia content in the textbook is directly um, stuff that we present in class. So it's a way to connect um, in a pretty simple way classroom lectures and the textbook. Um, the other, there's other benefits of the electronic textbook, which I'll talk about more, but obviously links to online material and data. Um, and it can be used as, to document the hands-on learning tools. Another thing that we've tried to do is evolve this textbook in time. So kind of having an open access electronic media allows for evolution of the material. Uh, another challenge is the need to reduce learning curve associated with modeling and real data analysis. So this is especially a challenge in introductory courses where fundamentally you want to get students to learn the basic concepts. The challenge, of course, is you can often enhance those uh, learning of those concepts with hands-on uh, analysis using real data and so on. But if you're using a modeling approach or data is in kind of some heterogeneous format, it can often uh, 
have a steep learning curve that can sometimes frustrate students and make it more difficult um, to integrate. So our proposed solution is to use MATLAB as our foundation for hands-on activities. Of course, there's trade-offs here. So on some level, using MATLAB is, is complex relative to other platforms like Excel or other things. Um, our rationale for doing that is, number one, in, at least in our um, engineering school and in many other engineering schools where hydrology is taught, students take a MATLAB course. So they, they do have that foundation. Um, but even for those who don't, you know, I view this as a relatively easy to learn platform, certainly compared to Fortran or C++ or other modeling uh, codes. And while it has the built-in programming, which we don't focus on a lot in terms of students having to do their own programming, it's more usage, the other main attractiveness of MATLAB is the visualization capabilities. So we want to leverage the ability to visualize data using this one platform. Um, another challenge is we want flexibility in the material covered um, so that, you know, instructors can pick and choose. They may not want to cover things in the same order or in the same kind of all-encompassing way as, as someone else. And so this is where the modularity comes in. So the way we constructed the learning tools is to try to be very modular so that these uh, codes or functions can be used independently for teaching individual concepts and then ultimately can be merged into a single watershed modeling framework. And our hope is that the modularity reduces the learning curve. And of course, this also has ancillary benefits. One of the things we try to accomplish is integrate students into model building. And this is one way to do it, is to really illustrate the modularity, how you can write little pieces of code, and then connect them via inputs and outputs. So just to kind of summarize our solution, we have this coupled e-textbook and modular modeling system. The textbook is called Introduction to Hydrology. Uh, I'll bring it up here in a second. It's been various forms of it have been offered to my class for a few years. We offered the first widely available edition last year, the 2014A edition. Currently posted, we have the 2015A edition. And then I'm starting classes in two weeks. I'm hoping to get um, this 2015B edition posted soon. In terms of format, it's available in, so it's written in iBooks format on iPad or viewing on Mac. And so that's kind of the, the native format. And I would say that's where the user functionality is highest. But understanding that that's not a platform everyone has access to, we also offer it in a PDF format. And I'll show, an I'll show the PDF format in a few minutes. And so again, the idea, especially with the, the iBooks format, is to make it a very interactive experience. So we're moving away from a traditional textbook and trying to integrate it into online data sources um, and other, other tools. The modeling system is our so-called Modular Distributed Watershed Educational Toolbox, or ModWet for short. And it's basically just a collection or a toolbox of many independent uh, MATLAB codes that we've developed over the years. And then an additional wrapper code, which kind of links everything together into a spatially distributed watershed model. And I should mention that, again, we've made choices here. We, we've chosen to go in a spatially distributed context. There's pluses and minuses for that. The main reason we do that is to kind of highlight spatial processes, spatial patterns that naturally occur in hydrology. Of course, the downside of that is calibration is an issue. Um, computational expenses an issue and other factors. I would say the way we've used this in the classroom has largely been as kind of a, a quantitative tool for improving qualitative understanding. So we haven't really focused on calibration and other things, at least in the introductory class. So it's mainly a way of visualizing spatially distributed processes at the watershed scale. And then before I forget, here's a link shown here where the, both the textbook and the modeling code is freely available. OK, so just a little bit of background on the textbook before we talk about the model. Uh, here's kind of the table of contents. I'll bring up the book here in a second. But it covers, uh, starts with kind of a broad view of the hydrologic cycle, both at the watershed scale and the global scale, and then marches through kind of atmospheric processes, including thermodynamics, radiation, circulation, precipitation. Then it moves into surface processes, including snow, unsaturated zone flow, infiltration, evaporation. 
Uh, and then kind of subsurface and surface response in terms of groundwater flow and uh, runoff and stream flow. And then the last chapter, or second to last, is really just an integration of the various modules which have been introduced up until that point. So mainly we proposed a simple, as simple as we can, um, spatially distributed watershed model, which again links to all of the processes we've been building toward. And because we've chosen MATLAB as our platform, we do have a chapter with, with, with a very basic MATLAB primer, um, where mostly we're just referencing other good primers that are out there, um, but with some specific pointers on how to use and set up our code. Some of the key attributes I would point out for the textbook, um, each chapter begins with learning objectives. Uh, there's significant usage of color graphics and multimedia content, largely to aid in providing conceptual understanding. Example problems, pointers to the relevant ModWit codes, uh, and then at the end of each chapter, conceptual questions, sample problems. And then there's some benefits to using an electronic format, which I'll talk about here in a second. So let me just exit out of the slideshow for a second. I just want to give you a really brief tour of the book. So here it is in PDF format. Again, it's available in PDF and iBooks. So I'm showing just the PDF. The iBooks has a little more functionality, but you'll get the gist here looking at the PDF. So here's the table of contents. I'm not going to go through the details, but again, the chapters are organized kind of in a consistent way where each chapter starts with learning objectives. I'll show what I mean by that in a second. Then has the body of the chapter, and then ends with pointers to the ModWet codes relevant to the material covered in that chapter, some conceptual questions, which are largely linking back to some of the learning objectives, and then some sample problems. So just skipping forward here. Uh, so this is the first chapter. Let me so this is just what the learning objectives look like. Nothing fancy here, but the, the main idea here is to really set the stage for students. So before we dive into the material, we and, and in class we kind of present these as well. And it's, it's really a way to get students thinking about the kinds of things we're going to be talking about. So rather than just react to the material, kind of have a, uh, an idea ahead of hand what what are the key things that we hope they, they learn from that chapter? Some are very conceptual. Some are a little more quantitative. Um, lots of color images, many of which are borrowed. So one of the reasons that we've opted for open access is we want to be able to leverage many of the uh, great graphics and multimedia content that's out there. So this is one example. I won't play the movie here because I'm not sure how it will show up. But this is just a simple uh, example from NASA showing the hydrologic cycle. Uh, and there's many other examples of these kind of um, movies throughout the text. And then with, within most sections, we have example problems to try to uh, link to the key concepts and provide some quantitative analysis for students. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, one of the kind of ancillary benefits that we weren't really thinking about when we decided to go electronic, but we've noticed is that it really, you know, most students are, are reading this on some online platform, so either on their desktop or laptop or tablet. And so it makes for a lot of seamless uh, connections to both online functionality and uh, annotation. So of course, because this is an electronic format, you can highlight text very easily, um, add notes for yourself, questions you may want to ask the instructor. So I've had many students bring their laptop with this highlighted showing uh, questions that they want to ask during office hours. Or if you don't understand a certain uh, word or terminology we're using, there's you know ability to look up the selected word online. And of course, we can access direct links to data. So having these embedded links, while being a very simple and straightforward thing, allows you to, in a very streamlined way, link students to data, documentation, or other things that are, that are of use. So we found it to be quite useful for students to get away from just the kind of typical textbook um, learning environment, uh, which is a bit maybe disconnected from other sources of information and really integrate it into that, these other sources. Um, 
just to kind of, again, at the end of each chapter, we have pointers to the mod wet code. So this particular chapter, we usually cover the definition of watersheds and watershed delineation. So we have a code that I'll illustrate here in a second that shows that. So we talk about that uh, or point students to each code. Some conceptual questions. So these are meant to be the kind of things that allow students a more descriptive understanding of the material. And then sample problems, which are both kind of typical textbook problems, hand calculations, as well as more detailed modeling type exercises that we tend to use in my class. OK, so that's kind of a brief intro of the textbook. Again, I would encourage you to go online and download it and take a more detailed look. We're kind of always looking for feedback, both in terms of any errors we find, but also the plan is to try to update it periodically to uh, include improvements. So coupled to the, to the textbook is the ModWet code. And so again, this is a modular system. So more or less each chapter, and the way it's organized is within the ModWet directory. When you download it, there's a chapter one directory, chapter two, chapter three, and so on. So each chapter basically contains the code that was first uh, introduced in that chapter. So among those topics are topographic analysis, things like watershed delineation, atmospheric ther thermodynamics, where we learn about air temperature, air humidity, how to convert between different metrics of humidity, radiation processes, both short wave, long wave, top of atmosphere fluxes, attenuation by the atmosphere, impacts of terrain, and so on. Precipitation processes, including Thiessen polygon method. Uh, then we get to, so these first set are kind of terrain analysis and then atmospheric processes. Then we start to get into the surface processes, including snow, where we introduce uh, complex terrain, albedo, simple mass energy balance models. Then we get into unsaturated flow, infiltration, evaporation, and introduce surface energy budget. Groundwater flow, where in the context of the model, we talk about topographic index as a metric for depth to groundwater. Runoff and stream flow, where we include a, a routing scheme. And then lastly, we have this integrated wrapper, effectively, which uh, links all of the different modules into a single watershed model. A few more items. So key attributes, again, this is open access. So you're welcome to download it, use it, use individual components of it, change them, look at sensitivities to parameters chosen, all of those kind of things. We've tried to do a good job of documenting it. So it's kind of documented uh, in the textbook to some extent, but then each code is well documented. It's MATLAB based, which most students have access to. If not through their computer labs at school, then through the student edition of MATLAB. Uh, we've focused mainly on physically based, spatially distributed uh, codes. We've provided a few sample data sets. We're trying to add to those every year. And it's something that we would happily solicit from others who might set up the model and use it in their own context. And it's coupled to the textbook. So we try to integrate the material in the textbook and the code as best we can. One of the things we found, or, or at least that links back to our goals, is we try to use the modular functions independently where we can early on as a way to kind of ease the student's transition into modeling. And so using a single function with single set of inputs and outputs tends to be something students can come up to speed on relatively quickly. And as we go through each kind of problem set over the course of the quarter, they get more and more familiar with how to use codes like that. And then it becomes a pretty easily understandable process to link codes where outputs from one become inputs to another. And then some examples of individual ModWet function usage. I'll show some examples here in a second. So we tend to start the quarter with some terrain analysis, watershed delineation, looking at slope and aspect. Um, and then another example is the um, uh, impact of terrain on shortwave radiation. So I'm going to get out of the slides here for a second. And I've written a simple MATLAB script mainly just for illustration. So we don't need to look at the code, but I'm just running this. The, the, the course typically starts with a DEM that students are given. But these could be downloaded from the sources that we saw on the website. So this is an example of one. This is a 90-meter DEM over the southern Sierra Nevada. 
easting and northing coordinates, and elevation over this domain. And so students are given in the first problem set a DEM, so this array of elevation along with an easting vector and a northing vector. And that's pretty much all they're given. And then, you know, we typically have them try to understand terrain, get their heads into it. And then one of the first activities we do is a watershed delineation. And so we typically give them a, an outlet coordinate. And so what's shown here, output in the MATLAB window down in the bottom right, is one example of an outlet. So these, this is an easting northing coordinate that I've basically specified. And given the DEM, easting northing coordinates, and the outlet, you can run our delineation code. So I'll run that forward. But those are really the only inputs. Oops. Let me start that over. Sorry about that. Let me. OK, let me start over. So here's our DEM. And then we run the delineation code. And the way it works is, so you see there's a prompt in the MATLAB screen. And effectively, what it does is it brings up a map of contributing flow area, flow accumulation. So in this plot, uh, the yellows are areas of high flow accumulation. The blues are areas of low flow accumulation. So students immediately start to understand the idea of ridges. So these dark blue areas are ridges. And the yellow areas are effectively stream channels. And so all the delineation is doing here is just giving you a check to say, is, are the coordinates that you specified on a stream channel, like you probably want, or on a major stream channel? And so it brings up this circle, which shows you where your coordinates fall on this DEM. And so in this case, they do fall on, a, um, on the main stream channel. And so if you agree with that, you can let it run forward, and then it'll generate the watershed. So first, there's a couple of figures it outputs. This is basically a watershed mask uh, for the Tokopa watershed. The red triangle is the outlet. Um, the white line is the nominal uh, watershed boundary. And then superimposed on that is that flow accumulation map, which nominally shows the flow network. And then what we try to do is we try to give students uh, an idea about how these two-dimensional maps are really just three-dimensional representations in space. And so this is where using MATLAB is useful. So what I'm doing here is I'm just using uh, kind of the viewer in MATLAB where students can kind of start to explore the terrain from various viewing angles. Okay, so they can start to see the ridge lines. The white stars or uh, symbols shown here are the kind of nominal stream channel. Uh, they can see how things are oriented north versus south and so on. And so one of the first things we do in class is use this delineation tool to expose students to control volumes and mass balance at the watershed scale. OK, and then a few other examples while I have this open. We have them look at slope and aspect. So let me bring these up. So this map here is the slope calculated from the DEM using another ModWet code draped over the terrain. So again, students can start to explore here areas in yellow or high slope areas. Areas in blue are areas of low slope. So you see low slopes down in the stream channel, typically higher slopes up on these hill slopes. And you can start to imagine how this might impact various things like flow of water, uh, incidence angle of energy, and so on. Another important parameter that we have students look at is aspect. So this map here is the map of aspect draped over the terrain. So in this particular context, north facing is 0 or 360 degrees. 90 is uh, east facing. 180 is south facing, 270 is west facing. So the pinks and reds are basically north facing slopes, and the kind of bluish, the cyan, green are south facing slopes. So students can explore using this uh, built in visualization how the terrain is oriented and start to think about how that might impact the geometry um, and therefore other fluxes. So you see 
largely of uh, north-facing slopes on one part of the watershed and south-facing in the other. Okay, and then later in the class we start to talk about radiation and we can start to see how these terrain functions impact radiation. One thing we expose them to is shade, so shade caused by terrain. So this is just a mask of shade where the blues are areas that are not in shade. Sorry, the yellows are areas not in shade and the blue are areas in shade. Uh, this particular uh, snapshot is winter solstice local noon. And so you see that most of the basin is not in shade, but you have these blue pixels, which are these steep north-facing slopes, which are actually in shade at noon on the winter solstice. So students start to get an idea of how the terrain can uh, impact spatial patterns. Okay, and then the last thing is the impact on shortwave radiation. So this is a similar map, but this is a map of the downwelling surface shortwave radiation on the winter solstice local solar noon over the domain. So this is a physical variable that drives most of the hydrologic processes we cover that is impacted by all of the things we've looked at. So slope, aspect, shade, as well as other things like elevation. And so students can start to see the impact or imprint of those uh, variables on uh, physical fluxes. So you see these, these areas in dark blue are those that are in shade and or north facing at high slopes. So much of that part of the basin is gonna be as low solar radiation. And then these brighter yellow orange areas are south facing um, slopes. So this is just an example of the kind of uh, usage of these ModWet uh, functions that we have students use. And then again, because as we use them throughout the course, we tend to build up to linking the various hydrologic processes. Okay, so speaking of that, um, the model itself at the end is mostly, again, just tying together these various processes. This is just a schematic of the a model, I won't go through the details here, but it has various components. So there's meteorological inputs, which get disaggregated as a result of terrain. We just saw that in, in the context of solar radiation, but other um, meteorological forcing variables are disaggregated as well. So that's where the topographic information comes in. We have a energy mass balance for snow, energy mass balance for soil. So we solve mass and energy balance. We have an infiltration component. Top model is chosen here as a relatively simple way to represent groundwater and saturation excess runoff. And then we have a routing scheme. And effectively, the wrapper, which brings all this together, is really just a large time-stepping loop. So all of the spatial calculations are vectorized in MATLAB so that at every time step, these various functions are called and calculate processes over the entire uh, domain and ultimately yield time series outputs, mapped outputs, and the hydrograph at the outlet, all of which can be visualized in MATLAB. So that's kind of the integration at the pixel scale. This is just a schematic of the various processes. We've tried to bo borrow models where we can. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, and we don't make any claims that these are the best models. It's really just a way to tr kind of credibly tie these processes together and at least provide a, a qualitative depiction of processes in space. So we have a snow model, forest restore, soil energy balance model, and groundwater. And the model is capable of generating different uh, runoff mechanisms, so infiltration excess, saturation excess, and base well. Okay, so given all that, uh, we kind of, the way our course is laid out, we work up to um, doing a, a full watershed simulation. Uh, we, with the code, we've tried to provide some kind of simple examples to get people up to speed so they can borrow these rather than invent their own. But uh, we've tried to develop the code in a way that uh, people can bring their own domains and models or uh, domains to uh, bear on this, with this code. Uh, that's a, it's a kind of constantly evolving code, so we're trying to make it as 
user-friendly as we can or more user-friendly going forward. So one of the kind of simple test cases we provide is the so-called toy basin. So if you look at uh, the panel A, this is our nominal toy basin. It's just a basically a V-shaped watershed. Um, it's hard to see because of the color bar, but with a, a east to west running uh, stream channel. So it's an easy way to kind of, on some levels, have symmetry, but on others have a north versus south facing slope and other kind of simple things. Uh, and then we've provided kind of different perturbations of this or different versions. One uh, is just a longer version of it. Another is a wider version of it. And lastly, a larger version. And we've just used this both in the book and in class to illustrate how different watershed characteristics can impact hydrologic response. So here's some examples of that. So these are uh, the response to a given precipitation event shown in gray um, of the different watersheds shown in the previous slide. So we have a larger basin, wider basin, longer basin, and nominal basin. So the black line is the nominal basin that we start with, and we see its response. If we look on the left panel, we have precipitation or runoff on the y-axis time. So this is a this is the model applied in kind of an event-based mode where we have one precipitation event and we're looking at how the watershed responds to different, or how watersheds of different characteristics respond to that forcing. So you see the nominal response in black, um, the longer response uh, has more runoff, so it has a higher peak, but it's also, there's a runoff which occurs over a longer period of time as that water moves toward the outlet. The blue curve is the wider basin, so it's not longer per se, but it has more contributing area, so you get a, a peak around the same time, but much higher peak flow, and then larger kind of combines those two. So the first uh, panel was really just looking at how watersheds respond to different types of watershed characteristics. Uh, the second one is another perturbation analysis looking at um, the effect of um, bed slope and uh, basin roughness. So the black is again the, um, so the, sorry, the, the magenta is the larger basin used here in, as a nominal case. And then we have a less rough basin, which peaks sooner with a larger peak, and a less, uh, a shallower basin, which peaks less and has more attenuation. So it's just a simple way to kind of start to illustrate how watershed characteristics can influence hydrologic response. Then the other type of um, test cases we uh, supply with the code are full year simulations. So this is one example for that same basin that we just delineated a few minutes ago, the Tokopah Basin. Um, and we've kind of ran it through a full year cycle, and basically all of the inputs are there, all of the outputs are there. So it um, both provides a ready-made example for instructors or students, and also uh, hints as how to kind of set up the model for your own watershed. So this just shows the topographic characteristics we already saw. And then the, among the outputs, some are spatial maps. So this, this is an example of the uh, spatially varying uh, meteorological inputs as distributed over the watershed with uh, two examples given. Air temperature in the top row, uh, surface incident shortwave radiation in the bottom row. Um, at four different dates, the day of water year 76, December 15th, then February 15th, April 15th, and June 15th. And so you see very clearly, and students are able to see how the terrain influences these forcing. So you see for air temperature, elevation plays the primary role. Um, so if you just look at one of those plots, we have uh, warmer temperatures at low elevations, cooler temperatures at higher elevations as well as the seasonality seen across the different maps. And for shortwave, we see similar seasonality in a broad sense, but we see the spatial patterns which are imprinted by the terrain. OK, so those are the kind of inputs, distributed inputs to the model. And then we have the outputs. So these are maps of various model states or fluxes at those same dates. So the top row, we have snow water equivalent. Second row, root zone soil moisture. Third row is the saturation deficit, which is 
um, analogous to the groundwater depth. Then we have some fluxes, snow melt, and net radiation. Okay, so maybe starting at the bottom row and working up, we have net radiation, which is largely a function of incoming shortwave, albedo, um, as well as some long wave effects. So you see very clear impact of terrain, say on the December 15th panel, as well as some of the others. Later in, in June, when we still have snow at the higher elevations, you see the imprint of albedo. Um, and so you can start to see the coupling between states and fluxes. So in this context, you see, going back to the top row, early in the simulation, snow is only at the highest elevations. Then the basin becomes fully snow covered, but if, with different amounts of SWE. And then during melt, we see the lower elevations melt out more quickly. And of course, this connects to root zone soil moisture, uh, saturation deficit, which drives runoff. And we see the snow melt, where we see different variations throughout the year as well. Another form of output from the model is time series. So we have the model output maps, typically every uh, of daily average outputs, but also time series, typically hourly, of basin averaged quantities so that students can get a, a feel a better feel for how these things evolve in time. So we have snow water equivalent um, increasing during the accumulation season, melting out, the response of uh, root zone soil moisture in the upper right, where it's basically relatively high as a result of snow melt and then dries out after as the snow starts to disappear. Um, saturation deficit, surface temperature, and then in the bottom two panels, we have surface fluxes, so net radiation, latent heat flux, sensible heat flux, seeing how those vary both uh, diurnally as well as over the season. And lastly, we have the outlet hydrograph. So in this particular case, we see that the main pulse of runoff is due to snow melt, not surprising for this basin. Um, so most of the runoff is occurring between day of water year 200 and um, 300. Okay, and so students can also analyze the various mechanisms of runoff generation. Last thing um, before concluding is perturbation simulation. So the hardest part, of course, is getting the model set up. Once you do, it becomes relatively easy to do perturbations. And I think in some, some ways those tend to be uh, even more interesting. So some simple examples that we've tried is something like an urbanization where you make the soil very impervious, or climate change simulation where you change the meteorological inputs. So here's just one example of a climate change simulation we did, uh, where all we did is we used the exact same four things except for air temperature, which we increased by two degrees, and had students look at how the snow water equivalent changed, which you see it was reduced significantly, but also how that changed runoff. And so what you see in this particular case is that even for this alpine uh, watershed, which is still snow dominated, you get a pretty significant change in the runoff regime, where there's still a significant snow melt component, but you have several of these large peaks earlier in the season. And so what we found is this can be a useful way to either wrap up uh, the quarter with a year-end project uh, and or we've used it in follow-on courses where students can kind of carry over the knowledge gained by using the model. Just We've tried to close the loop. So last year was the first full implementation of the textbook and model. And so we did some survey of the students to try to get at some learning assessments. Uh, I won't go into the details here. But by and large, uh, we found that the students uh, found the uh, ModWet code to have aided either, uh, they either agreed or strongly agreed that it aided in their understanding of hydrologic processes. OK, so some conclusions. Um, first, I just want to reiterate the project is very much an ongoing experiment. Um, so it's we're trying to make sure this evolves over time. But here's some preliminary kind of summary or findings that we found. One is that using the coupled e-textbook and, and ModWet uh, codes make uh, implicitly a holistic um, understanding more accessible to students both kind of in theory from our construct, but also through the assessment that we've done. 
Uh, the e-textbook provides a modern teaching tool, which we think significantly leverages existing content that's out there. So we want to try to bring in as much content as we can and make it easy for students to learn both kind of in a traditional textbook way, but also using other data sources. The modular code um, reduces the learning curve for students. Uh, it becomes an easy way, relatively easy way, to have students understand how different physical characteristics impact watershed response. And by being a spatially distributed model, emphasizes space-time variability. And so far, and we, I haven't done a great job of making this an automated tracking process, but just uh, anecdotally from keeping in touch with people, last year we had about 15 to 20 faculty adopt the textbook uh, and or the codes in various ways. So some have made it a required text. Some have made it just a reference text. Some have used um, some components of the ModWet uh, toolbox. Others have used more extensive use. And we're excited about that. We hope more people will at least experiment with it. Um, and in doing that, we hope to get kind of continuous feedback from users, which we already did last year. We've integrated a lot of that. And we hope to make this an evolving process. So there are plans to add both more modeling processes. One thing that's missing is an explicit, explicit vegetation scheme. But also, probably the, the bigger focus will be on improving user functionality, adding more test cases, and revising the textbook. Uh, acknowledgments. Um, so many thanks to many of the students, graduate students, who've helped either in the development of the code over the years or in the development of the textbook. Uh, I'd like to also thank the UCLA undergrads, who've been guinea pigs for this uh, for the last five years at least, um, largely to positive response. And we've also gotten some funding to support this from NSF as well as UCLA Office of Instructional Development. Uh, just to kind of circle back, for more info, there's a paper that Lori, who's been heavily involved in the development of this, uh, published, as well as information on our website. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you so much, Steve. So if anyone does have a question at this time, please feel free to type it into the chat box. It uh, looks like we have a couple coming in. Uh, let's see. Um, so a question from Manaj Gamir. Dr. Margolis, it is a very interesting talk and effort to fulfill the textbook requirement on modeling. Hopefully it can be used in mountain terrain like Nepal. I am interested to integrate and link the result to USGS ModFlow. Is it possible? Um, so it's certainly, well, I don't want to make claims that I, I can't back up. Um, it's, we haven't really thought about integrating it into a more complex uh, groundwater model. Uh, one of the things we've tried to stay away from is really making it research grade per se. Um, I mean, we've, we've tried to represent the processes as best we can, but you know, acknowledge that there are you know, lots of work out there that take each of these processes um, and develop them more um, comprehensively. So a lot of what we've done is made simplifying assumptions where we can to make the code uh, easier to run, faster to run, and so on. Um, so certainly in terms of applications to other basins, um, like in Nepal or other remote places, it would be a very interesting thing to do. Uh, we'd be interested in helping get those models set up or, or seeing results people have obtained using the model. In terms of coupling to things like um, mod flow, I'd have to think about that. I mean, we have a very simple groundwater component in this model. Um, presumably, you could kind of decouple it from that and then use some of the infiltration and recharge fluxes to for something like uh, mod flow, but it would be a it would be a significant undertaking. Okay, great, thanks. Another question from Theodore at SUNY ESS. What plans do you have for simulating water regulation, such as reservoirs? What plans do you have for water quality and sediment discharge simulation? Uh, that's a good question. So, again, it kind of goes back to what what. Uh, the emphasis of this work is. Um, so it's really meant to be a teaching tool. And of course, it could be used as a teaching tool in those aspects as well. Um, in the course that we offer here, it's really 
more about the hydrologic, kind of the natural hydrologic cycle for more natural watershed. So we don't have any immediate plans to incorporate those other kinds of uh, components. And you know whether this is the best tool to do so, I think we, we'd have to think about um, whether it would make sense. Uh, you know, everything we add adds computational expense, and it can detract from running it in kind of an educational context. OK, great. And a question from David Tarbotten. Um, he said it's tremendous overall um, and has a question about using real data in the model, such as real stream flow, real meteorologic forcing, where to get the data, real vegetation, uh, land c cover change scenarios, et cetera. Yeah, good question. So we've um, we try to use real data wherever we can. So um, obviously, it depends how you define that. So for example, some of these alpine basins we've simulated where we don't necessarily have great in situ gauges, we've used things like uh, NLDAS gridded meteorological data, uh, which you know incorporates lots of real data to uh, force the model. So we've tried to use not synthetic meteorological data, but at least credible meteorological data that's you know credible for those that domain elevation um, includes the seasonal cycle and everything like that. And we've used real DEMs. Um, most of our work has used the Aster DEM from NASA, um, NLCD land cover we've used. Um, and well, we haven't done calibration with real stream flow per se in one of the follow-on courses at UCLA where we have a little more room to have students uh, do more in-depth analysis. We did have students compare the model to that you run off and do kind of a very manual calibration. And so um, there's issues, of course, with a spatially distributed model and how you get the data and how well you know it, um, how it varies over space. But we tried to use real data wherever we can. Great. A question from Ahmad Habib. Um, he says, very impressive effort. I may have missed this, but can the instructor use these tools for his or her local catchment? How much new work does he or she have to do, such as gathering, uh, data gathering and code modification? Uh, great question. So our hope is that, yes, every instructor who uses it um, would have their own kind of test bed that we could hopefully get back from them and post with every new iteration of the code. Um, you know, there's only our second year, so I, I wouldn't say we've been overly successful doing that yet. We've mainly added our own test cases here and there. Um, so I'm hoping to kind of get more feedback from people. I, I've got a few folks who used it last year who were trying to get um, watershed set up for them. Uh, one of the things we're doing in the 2015B version, which should be posted in a week or two, is a lot more um, pre-processing codes that are designed to speed up exactly that, namely setting up basins in your own area and so on. So in terms of code modifications, the idea would be you don't really need to modify the code per se. Um, there are certain processes which, again, we don't explicitly represent, like vegetation in many ways right now. So if it's a highly vegetated catchment, that may cause problems. but um, otherwise, the idea is the code would more or less be untouched, and it would really be just getting the input data set up properly and then running the code for that uh, catchment. And of course, one thing I did mention is the, the way the code scales in terms of computational expense is directly with the number of pixels. So there's some experimentation people need to do with resolving things at a resolution that they're comfortable with, but also making it so that it runs pretty quickly for a student on a uh, laptop or desktop computer. OK, question from Ann Jefferson. Any advice for faculty teaching hydrology and interested in your book, but who do not have access to MATLAB for use with their students? Uh, good question. Um, so I think the book certainly stands alone as a, as a useful tool. So I think, you know, Several people have used it as a reference. Um, so I think it's useful in that context. A similar thing, before I get back to the MATLAB, you know, some, some people teach in a geography department where maybe the, uh, the math level isn't quite as high as in engineering, and so that's an issue. So I think one 
response is just using the book as a reference where it is useful. Again, we try to build in conceptual understanding as much as quantitative. Uh, in terms of MATLAB, um, you know, the student version of MATLAB is not that expensive. Uh, so I, I try to get students to um, get their own version anyway, just because it tends to make it easier for them to, to do these things. Uh, otherwise, you know, I, I would think approaching your, your departments or whoever provides software and, and trying to get a license. It's, it's a tool that has a lot of capabilities, not just for this, obviously. So it's, it's something that I would try to do. The other thing which we haven't experimented with at all, which others may be much more experienced with, is um, Octave. I'm, I'm guessing some of you are familiar with that. It's, it's meant to be an open access version of MATLAB, which I've frankly never used myself so, or, uh, and or tested the code. So that's a, theoretically a possibility as a completely open access um, solution, but I haven't tested it. And David Tarbon asks, are there any thoughts on using R um, or an entirely web-based functionality? given the question about the MATLAB access? Yeah. Um, that's probably something he or others could answer better than me. I really um, don't, I'm not that familiar with R. Um, so it's it's possible. Uh, we've tried to make the, the code is pretty well documented and understandable. So I, I think porting it wouldn't be a huge effort, but it's it's an effort kind of beyond the scope we're planning at the moment. Okay. And have you gotten any feedback from your own students? Um, what did they like or what did they not like? Yeah, good question. So one thing that we fight uh, and we're continually trying to prove is making sure students leave the class um, happy that it was a hydrology class and not a MATLAB class. And again, how much of that is a factor depends largely on the background of the student. Our students have a MATLAB class that they take. Um, sometimes it's a year or more before they kind of get to my class. So one thing we found uh, that's very useful is um, really trying to get students up to speed on the MATLAB in the first recitation. Even before our first lecture, we have a primer. And it's we don't try to teach them all of MATLAB. We try to teach them the MATLAB they need for the model so that they become very comfortable using it and it's not this huge overhead. And so the I think the danger of using these hands-on tools, and this not just this one but others, is it be, can become, if it's so burdensome to students to use, then they can kind of shut off their interest in the topic or maybe not learn the material in the way they have. So feedback from our students has been you know, largely positive, and I think the area where we're trying to improve it is make the um, user friendliness of the code as as high as we possibly can. OK, great. So it looks like there's a little discussion about the MATLAB and the chat box. Uh, does anyone else have any questions for Steve before we sign off? Uh, let's see, it looks like Katie Farnsworth said, would you be willing to share your lessons or activities for that intro to MATLAB you need for this course? Yes, great question. So we are we're developing the user manual, which we have not published before, and that's going to be up very soon. So our classes start in a couple weeks, and so the idea is to have that up. It's a little bit specific to kind of the UCLA setup, but I think it's going to be a useful uh, user guide. And um, so I think where our focus will be mainly going forward more than making the model have more bells and whistles in terms of processes is really trying to make it as user friendly as possible. So we plan to post as much as we can on the website, both in terms of user manuals, test cases, and other things. Great. Would you be able to send me a link to those items so that we could include it with the recording on the Quasi website? Yes. Well, they will be at the same link um, shown. I don't know if my slides are still on the screen. They are, yeah. Um, but we're going to put everything there. So at the moment, okay. at, at that website is the book, the ModWit codes, and then my guess is we'll have the user manual uh, in one of the ModWit code directories. So when you unzip the code, you'll have that. Uh, but that's where we're going to house any 
any of the additional information we, we can provide. And you know, I should say we're happy to help. So if, if you're willing to try it and you have, you're having a particular problem with something, um, you know, shoot me an email and we can try to maybe diagnose what the problem is. Great. Um, let's see, another question from David Tarbutton. Do you face the challenge of engineering students wanting material they can immediately use in practice? Um, he really likes the conceptual learning aspects of your approach, but in his own experience has found that students sometimes are put off by it being too theoretical. Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's, it's a, it is a challenge. Um, because yeah, this is not preparing them to use you know some of the Army Corps codes or things like that. Uh, we do have other courses which are more designed for that, and I think it's it is a real challenge. I mean, there are students who are this is a required class at UCLA, so you have students who are primarily structural engineering students, and you know are I don't want to say being forced to take this class, but in, on some level they are. Um, so what we try to do beyond the hydrology is uh, really emphasize the more general aspects of the course that they, in terms of analyzing real data, plotting real data, explaining real data, um, which is not model specific, but is something that you know most fields um, need. And so we, it's definitely there's a, a salesmanship piece to it where you need to um, sell them on what what they're getting out of it and that the invested time is worth it. And that's where the more we can make it um, easier to use and pick up, the less likely I think that kind of complaint tends to creep in. All right, well, we are right at the top of the hour, so I think that we should um, sign off for the day. But Steve, thank you so much for the presentation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. And then as a reminder, next week we have the third and final talk in the series of on the excuse me, virtual workshop on data driven hydrology education. Um, we're going to hear from Ahmad Habib, David Tarban, and Akman Lal on development of student centered modules to support data and model driven active learning in hydrology. So that will be Tuesday, September twenty second at three o'clock PM. Um, and again, if you have a poster that you'd like to present